Hello and welcome to the second video of our Leadership Capability Think Building series. This uh, is the second intervention in our leadership journey and it's around managing innovation under uncertainty. To set the context of the program, while the word innovation sticks out in the naming of the program, it is not about understanding innovation as a discipline. The context of the program is firms' responses in an environment of uncertainty when uncertainty is an opportunity for firms to transform themselves either to change their business model, respond to competition or to align themselves with unmet needs of the customer. Having said that uh, as a broad theme, let me take you through uh, what are the questions that we are solving for in this intervention. The first question, how should organizations navigate their innovation processes under uncertainty where again the key word is navigation and uncertainty. What organization levers should be activated to respond effectively? When I talk about organization levers, it is culture, work processes, structural levers and so on and so forth and decision choices that leaderships make. Third is, how does one identify new dimensions under which innovation is possible? Now this is a very critical question. Innovation for innovation's sake often does not create value. So at what context should I place innovation and my innovation bets is critical to sustenance of enterprises in sectors which are undergoing rapid transformation. And finally, how do organizations manage opportunities of innovation in the future? So what are we trying to achieve? In the first uh, program that our participants went through, they learned about industry structure, disruption, mega trends, and how industries are transforming themselves from verticalized known sectors into larger ecosystem, the impact of tech firms and unicorns on the way businesses are run, the impact on business model and so on and so forth. In this mayhem of disruption, how do individual firms respond? What are the levers of responses? What choices do they have? And after all of this, how much value can they capture for themselves? There are four sections of this two-day program. The first one is the understanding of uncertainty as a discipline and uncertainty as defined and distinctive from risk. The second one is how do I respond to it? Third is expanding diversity. What are my choices of the future? And fourth, what does the future hold for me? And as you see some icons here, these are case studies like Bank of America, Microsoft Office, Apple here, Intel here are case studies that are discussed. And of course, Dell, I forgot to mention on section two, are case studies through which we drive our discussion. Day one, in day one, we talk about the concept of innovation and the concept of uncertainty married together and the generic responses to an environment of uncertainty and risk. Now framing the challenge of uncertainty in terms of how an organization navigates this innovation landscape. Now hold on to this word innovation landscape which is a very important and germane context to understand as we take our strategic innovation bets and the timeliness of bets determine a firm's strategic choice and its sustainability of the future. Simply put, where will I put my money in and how do I know that it's going to succeed and create a uh, create superior returns for me in the future. Now there are three themes that we discuss here. One, which is the most important one I guess, is innovation and uncertainty are intrinsically linked. Now what does that mean? When industry structures are morphing under multiple impact of societal, technological changes and economic trends, incumbent organizations face uncertainty and their vulnerability to new ways of doing business increases. Consequently, their strategies of asset incumbency, of brand incumbency, customer intimacy are all challenged by newer entrants who use technology to their advantage. Now let's take a life insurance example to understand what is uncertainty. 
Now, typically in the life insurance industry, uh, you have a product push environment, which is distributed by channels. The channel could be a banker, corporate agent, your own channel, outsource channel, and so on and so forth. Large organizations in the sector have mastered channel expansion and profitably expanding channel, making investments for channel, building right products to meet customer needs. All of this is great. This is an environment of stability. When this fundamental environment of stability is confronted by changing customer needs, by personalization as a definitive need of individuals, of their needs to be serviced differently and better, it actually fundamentally goes against the grains of asset incumbency and therefore impacts core assets of these organizations. The larger you are, the more vulnerable you are, more vulnerable you are at risk. Being because as leaders, since you have built up an organization based on certain strengths, you would tend to assume that the past predicts the future. And in that assumption, there is a strategic myopia of incumbent leaders which opens up an uncertain environment and opportunity for younger incumbents, more nimble incumbents to change the customer narrative, to do things differently, thereby creating value and slowly but surely eat into the incumbent's position and lead to its nemesis and destruction over a period of time. And that is where uncertainty is an opportunity for newer entrants to create value and upstage the incumbents. It is The concept is about creating a new hill to fight rather than trying to take a taken hill, metaphorically speaking. The second is, the second point we just talked about, the third is organizations must design quote-unquote the equipment necessary to take advantage of the situation. New incumbents which take advantage of uncertainty in the environment have methodically created knowledge assets and capabilities and nimble footedness to be able to confront the incumbent challengers, uh, the incumbent players. To doing so, it's a thoughtful process and not randomized. So we need to figure out what that process is and how do we take advantage of the situation, which is again a very important discussion in this two-day journey for the participants. This slide, I will request you to spend a couple of uh, a few seconds reading the slide and I'll call the significant parts of it. Uncertainty arises from the inability to know all states of the world. Uncertainty is incalculable, risk is measured. Risk, by definition, is the probability of a negative event happening. To that an extent, it is probabilistic in nature and therefore measured even if, it's in, even if it is imperfect. While uncertainty is the inability to know all states of the world. Which means that how a particular industry will be disrupted at what points in time is not a question of immediate probability which will fall into a mathematical equation. And therefore our inability to predict it creates uncertainty in the environment which is as differentiated from risk and opportunity for newbies to take a position, a vantage position or create a new hill or a new position to capture value or create new narratives, new customer journeys, new processes, new products and new ways of doing business. Hence, effective management of innovation depends critically on our ability to respond to what is not known. And therefore, this is an important quote, it's kind of a mouthful, but I'll read it out for you. There are known things, and, are, and there are things that we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, there are some things we do not know. But there are unknown unknowns, the ones we do not know, we do not know. And in the zone of being in the unknown unknown is the discovery of the process of innovation, product design and customer engagement, which is where we need to take calculated and methodical bets to be able to survive in this mayhem of disruption. Going forward, this is again an abstract concept, a difficult concept to understand, 
but an important concept nevertheless. This is a concept called innovation landscape. It's a map of pursuit, value, creation, opportunities in the firm available to it. It's the ability to push the thinking envelope to create disproportionate value in a landscape where you create a position of uniqueness as differentiated from your competitors. Design spaces is to achieve actual value, organization has to specifically bet on parts of the landscape. It must harvest options now. Now let us try and understand it with an example. Let's take life insurance as a context. Now if you take life insurance in India, it has tough four or five incumbent players. These players could be bank backed or could be pure life insurance players have incumbency in chan channels, have well-known product designs, have deep pockets, and an outreach which is unassailable. Now, an innovation landscape for a new entrant in this business obviously would not be to be able to replicate the chan channels or take the asset incumbency of the existing players head-on. Now, that would be foolhardy. How do I therefore use a different method to discover my customer, engage them in a journey, and to create a product or service that is not offered by these big players is the notion of my innovation landscape or where would I need to innovate to create that value without going into direct confrontation with the incumbents. The reason we do not advocate a direct competition with the incumbents is it is often an expensive proposition. And newbies or startups or in short text will do not have the financial capacity or the management bandwidth to fight the war. Therefore, it is the imagination of taking and building a completely new narrative is what an landscape, innovation landscape is all about and creating a new norm or a new paradigm in the industry. The design space is specifically the actions that you need to take now to be able to reach or reap or harvest the value of the future. Now let's try and understand this with an example. Both of these brands we understand and we recognize, Yahoo and Google. <coughs> Both search engines, not the first search engines, but reasonable competitors. When Google started off, off a project in the university, Yahoo was already an incumbent player in the search agency, business, uh, in the search business. Yahoo was probably three, four times Google, but today Google is one of the most valued firms in the world. Now let us see, how did Google change the landscape through creative imagination. We know of the phenomena that Google was probably the first company in the world which embraced outcome economy, which it basically meant that you do not pay to advertise, but you pay when you get results of an advertisement. So you do not pay for the input, but you pay for the results. And they did so by creating Google AdWords and AdSense, which competed against the rich text ads of Yahoo. Primarily what Yahoo did, it had a much better interface. It had rich ads, beautifully structured. So if you had to give an advertisement to Yahoo, you would pay a fixed rate. Google just confronted that entire thing by saying that I can't play the game that Yahoo is playing. Therefore, do not pay me a fixed flat fee upfront. If there is an e-commerce transaction which I originate for you, I take a cut. It's something like Uber does with its driver partners. Happened long ago. That was the first little example of taking the game away from the incumbent rich text, uh, rich text advertisement business of Yahoo. And over a period of time, Yahoo did an ad exchange, but Google actually moved on before the alphabet phenomena to create the Google Cloud, Google Maps, Android, YouTube, to find all the ecosystem around this incumbent search business and the value that they generated from it. They actually used data sciences to take punts and push the envelope into multiple industries. Now what landscape is, innovation landscape is Google's imagination of the fact that data that I generate from the search business can be monetized from multiple parts to change the business model of existing players of other industries is the landscape which is on the right side, which we talked about. I mean, it would not be wrong to say Waymo is actually part of a design landscape which comes from the data incumbency that Google has built over a period of time. Simply put,
Google believed that data is going to be the new oil and therefore mine data effectively and use data and analytics to create value in sectors which the mega trends which we spoke about in the previous video going to impact. That is the power of Google. And therefore, what we do in the discussion is to help in, in a real life setting is to help draw from the participants who their top competitors are and therefore how do I take the narrative away from them without capital expenditure and by using a mental model or a framework of innovation to say where therefore should I take my bets on making certain reasonable assumption on the customer, the technology is available and the way the customer journeys are going to make, emerge over a period of time. Now, behind all of this, a lot of innovation projects fail and how do we demonstrate the failure of a project at a generic pattern level? So the case that we use is a Harvard case called the case of Vasa and Vasa is the ship here. Vasa was commissioned by the Swedes it was a mega battleship. About 5% of their GDP was invested in Vasa by King Carl Gustavus II Adolphus to fundamentally enable his maritime expansionist plans. It had the best of designers, a ship which was to be built on a particular design which they had mastered over a time. But the moment Vasa was commissioned, it toppled 100 yards from its destination. The discussion was, is why did this project fail? Which was a, such, a, such an important project and the life of a nation was at stake. The parallels that we draw is, in a pharma industry, you build what you call a blockbuster drug and the drug fails and you don't know why. Or a critical project in an organization which is supposed to change the fortunes of the organization fail and you don't know why. The point is to find a pattern using a setting of Vasa and medieval Europe as the context to see if the patterns emerge. The way we do the discussion is the king is the customer, of course, he commissioned the ship. Vasa was the product, the unstable ship. The context was the Battle of Poland and Sweden's maritime expansion. Finally, the shipyard, ship, the shipyard had the designer and the state of knowledge was shipbuilding. Now the discussions are what kind of uncertainties that the project actually faced. Uncertainty from the context, the customer, communication, capabilities, sorry, four kinds of uncertainties. We use these four words or the four C's and take a real life project from your organization and do an exercise with the participants to say apply the four C's. And if it was successful, define why it was successful. And if it failed, tell us why it failed. And why could it have failed? What were the context, the reasons of failure? And what were the learnings from it? The next case is to understand that when people take significant bets on projects which transform enterprises, what are the challenges that they face? This was around what we use is a Hewlett Packard case and the context in that case is, a, is called the Kitty Hawk. Kitty Hawk was the ultimate disk drive or a storage device which fundamentally changed the landscape of the entire industry. Kitty Hawk did not succeed. Now we use the VASA framework on Kitty Hawk to generate the same set of learnings and here is what we talk about. In commercializing a disruptive technology Manufacturers are faced with fundamental strategic choices, which are as thus. First option is to accept that the market needs are well defined and push the technology or of the product to its limit to address an established need of a market, uh, needs of an established market, sorry. So first what you do is accept the market needs are well defined and push the limits of technology. This is a technology push strategy, provided that you have all the levers of technology in your hand and you can push it to create a need which is already established. Now, how do we know that the need is established when we are designing the project as a response to the environment? Because whatever needs, whatever data that we collect, we would have our own biases, our sensing biases, the data would be incomplete because we are projecting into the future on the relevance of the market. So it always becomes a challenge. However, 
The second alternative is to accept that the current technology capabilities are given and do not do a technology push and then seek a market that will value the inherent attributes of the technology. So you do not try, now this is fairly counterintuitive, you do not try to push the technology or the power of the technology to its limits and find a market that will value the inherent capability of the technology, which is a very, very significantly different judgment than the ones in option one. Research has shown that almost most winners in disruptive technology pursue the latter route, the vast majority of established firms instinctively do the former, which was called out by the late great Clay Christensen, one of the giants on which this whole discipline of innovation was built. I will repeat this again, this is a very fundamental point. Firms intuitively try to excel on technology and believe that the market will be created. That's a natural thing. The firms who succeed actually understand the limitations of technology and find a market which inherently values the technology. Now here's the point. Now, if I were to translate it to a product or in the digital world, customer discovery, would you try, in absence of data, try to create a product which is purely personalized and then wait for customers to adopt that product? or? you would know your limitations and give customers a different route of choices and enable a network in which those choices would work. Very different things. And again, people who succeed, generally, as for Clayton Christensen's research, adapt choice too. When searching for new technology, the probability that its own technology may or may not succeed, but also take into account the risk that additional technologies which are critical for ultimate end use application might not work. Whenever we are dis designing something or an innovative product, this product is, it is not about the standalone product, but the peripheral value, per peripheral technologies which make the product work has to be equally stable for our success. Now this is a very different way of thinking that either I believe that it's not about Whenever a technology is successful, it is not about our technology on a standalone basis, but a combination of factors, which is other technologies which make it play. This thinking is called ecosystem thinking as against product thinking. The product thinking would work in a world where product incumbency in an analog world could take you through success. Now there are so many other factors linked to your product that unless all of those factors are stitched, the adoption of technology is never guaranteed and most often they're not would fail. This is fundamental in the thinking about uncertainty and innovation and we try and amplify it through the Kitty Hawk case. Fairly intense and what we do as a result of the Kitty Hawk case is to kind of work through its mistakes and use a discussion by crowdsourcing projects and products that the current organization, the organization that the participants come from are using and kind of throw it open to them and say that how could you have failed or why did you succeed. Now oftentimes people attribute the wrong reasons for success and big learning here is to figure out the specific reasons of success and the replicability of a reason as a pattern makes a success scalable, innovation possible, and as a bet against uncertainty and our ability to take on bigger competitors. It's a key competency of organizations. Now, at the second level, we talk about firms' ideal response to new development and business ventures. Now, how do I respond to uncertainty? Organizations, remember, most organizations are designed to respond to certainty, status, status quo, and predictability. Can you have an organization, therefore, to respond to uncertainty, to orthogonal disruption, and fundamental value changes in the value drivers of the sector? It's a very, very complex question. Now, from a teaching standpoint, it's very difficult to kind of continue to lecture people on the subject. And therefore, we kind of 
do it through case studies, but here I am outlining four principles under which in the product development level one could find a relationship between innovation and uncertainty. And this was done by Professor Alan McCormick, Harvard Business School, Technology and Operations Management, who researched this and came up with four patterns. First is product quality and time of release. Projects which have early version of the product released to customers at each stage of development perform better than products in which most functionality is developed. The point that he makes that products which are not fully developed use the customer's power and energy to co-develop it generally perform better than products which are designed by the designer's imagination and his insights only. So the first point is crowdsource the product, see the customer response, build a prototype and go along with the customer rather than trying to do it all yourself. Contributive for organizations that pride themselves for technology prowess and that is also a nemesis of these organizations. Second, uncertainty mediates the relationship between flexibility and product quality. Now this is a fairly complex point but the moot point is projects with greater uncertainty, projects which have higher risk of failure actually the flexibility of the project management process and the design process actually predicts the performance of the product. Imply that uncertainty can be a source of advantage for firms which have a right capabilities for managing it. It is a source of disadvantage of firms who cannot. So therefore organizations who manage uncertainty as a strategic lever actually convert are more flexible and deliver products of a very different kind. Third thing is how you are designed as an organization defines your product roadmap which is explained by the failure of Netscape Navigator and the growth of Internet Explorer. Now this is an example of the Netscape Navigator of the browser wars, the fabled browser wars between the Netscape Navigator and the Internet Explorer and I just, why don't you just uh, look at the slide, it's fairly self-explanatory and then we'll come and debrief it. The key learning here is Internet Explorer as a design level was not managed as a standalone project but a platform of coordinated activities which crowdsourced information and design and kept it flexible as against try to hard code it which is the story of the Netscape Navigator. Now, is there a pattern in which projects that succeed or do not succeed? Now while researching those patterns there are three kinds of products uh, three kinds of projects, typical project types which need to be treated differently. The first is called the learning interdependency where projects have a knowledge or capability which are transformed, uh, which are transposable between organizations. Now think whether you are learning a customer discovery project, a customer discovery project and a mid office project and a back office project are linked. They are linked because knowledge has to be transformed, uh, transposed between each project and the other and rather than, learning, uh, rather than running them as perfect silos, how do you create knowledge dependency, flow of information so that the back office and the middle office are aligned to what you are doing on the customer side is one kind of a project. The second is the technology interdependency. Now, typically this comes around the digital transformation uh, kind of projects, we manage uh, uh, digital transformation projects. Imagine a project which is run uh, or a digital project which is about transposing digital technologies on your existing system. What are the dependencies that you have? Now, typically if you do not have a unifying uh, BPM, uh, business process management or an enterprise content management platform, how will you therefore manage the data, flow of information across multiple touch points and break the existing silos to give a 360 degree view of the customer is a matter of discussion in this kind of a project. And finally, there are organization transformation projects where each individual sub projects are integrated with the program level performance. The reason why we discuss these three archetypes of projects is to help people differentiate 
the context deliverables of the project as against trying to create a one size fits all. In our experience, in our consulting experience, organizations that do not set up innovation projects relevant in the context and manage information and knowledge actually perpetuate a silo behavior which then either creates suboptimal value or erodes value. And that is the learning from this deck, uh, from this slide, sorry. Now when you talk about organization response and how do organizations respond, it is difficult to theorize about it. So typically what we do is in development process fact flexibility, we talk about Microsoft, insistence in process experimentation, we take a Bank of America case, organize your portfolio program design, how do you create prototypes, co-discover with your customers and scale up, which is first you do a prototype, you do not release it to the customer, take relevant inputs, remove your existing biases and gradually scale up and this is done through a question and answer session and there are uh, basically also we talk about the failure of the development process of Microsoft 2000 and why it failed and then we see that from a waterfall design how did a product specification from a feature design work out. Now while this is very detailed content I am not going to labor on this in this presentation but the point here is we actually take a product development life cycle and try and stress test it under different conditions of uncertainty and say that in a sequential build of a product prototype, what were the advantages and disadvantages and help the cohort or the class to understand it and replicate it in the near context, in their context using their frameworks and tools. Now this is a case study with an insurance company where we talked about product development, go to market, innovation structures and big bets. So here's what we discuss in the life insurance thing. We're saying that you are not an incumbent player, but you desire to be one of the greatest life insurance companies in the country. You have, you are pitted against incumbency. And if you are pitted against incumbency, how do I therefore create a narrative or a mind share of a customer which is differentiated and differentiated, which is scalable and profitable. Our ability to do it is on our ability to rethink the product, the entire product life cycle, engagement of the customer, capture relevant data and create alternatives which is easier to use, convenient and beneficial to the consumer while I make money. So the entire business model design works on this premise. Typically this is a very, very intensive exercise. We break uh, customers, uh, we break our participants into cross-functional groups and in that groups we kind of debate each other's products and, and kind of come to an overarching picture of therefore where should we play and how should we win. Now this is a case discussion of Bank of America. There are a few questions. Again in the context of the case, I'll give you a second to kind of read these questions. But don't be obsessed about it. This is discussed in class and probably not relevant for these videos. But never said, it's a very important part of the class. And here's the preview of it. Day two is looking into the future and hedging your innovation bets and creating an ecosystem to be able to be successful. Now, the way it's done, the first section is called expanding diversity, where we use innovation possibility as an outcome of what the market needs, what meanings that I can create for the consumer, and therefore what technology functions are available at my disposal. So it's an intersection between the market or the customer, his needs, technology functions or what technologies are at my disposal and what meanings I can create. So here, recognize I am not pushing the technology capability to find a market. I am finding a market which inherently values my technology and creating meaning for customers to adapt it. So I am creating an ecosystem, learning from the Kitty Hawk case or the Microsoft case and from the work done by Clayton Christensen to find a market that inherently values my technology but that's not good enough because the customer has to find meaning or an emotional connect for the technology and the market to be linked and the business to be scaled up. So how do you explain this? The whole idea is design-led intervention and we do it with what is called the famous IMAC exercise 1998. So we say that you know 1998 the SPAC book was launched 
Now, what was the meaning or messages that the MacBook evoked? Why was MacBook such a success from the emotional connect of the device? What science materials were used to make it attractive for the cohort? And therefore, what influences did MacBook use and what inspirations it could create? And we ask participants to kind of loosen up their thinking hats and use color, imagination, and so on and so forth to do it. And here's what we see. MacBook was a computer that was not like a computer. The product was everything that a computer was not supposed to be. It was not supposed to be the geeky, bulky, functional IBM product. It was supposed to be cool, sophisticated, interesting, beautiful, attractive, and it used all the colors and the features which was smooth and soft to design as against the chunky and hard thing. This was primarily creating the emotional connect of the product to create an absolutely different market. Geeky versus cool and stylish. Now if you zoom into the slide, you will see the geek on the right hand side versus the funky new age guy who uses the computer as almost like a fashion apparel. The materials, translucent, plastics convey a sense of cool, symbols, the non conformist branding, forms, curves, and color, sleekness and style, appeal, density, and a completely new market. Technology being the same. Now think about it. Where did this inspiration come from? If you've known, if you're from the PDA generation of O2, round and intuitive interface. The O2 was round and intuitive. Watches, the swatch watches, multiple color. Auto, Volkswagen Beetle were all influences that a MacBook used to generate its first computer design. What did it design? May you see? Polaroid, healthy snacking, all the colorful gaiety stuff. The point here is to conclude on the subject, did MacBook have a differentiated technology? iMac, sorry, not the MacBook. Did iMac have a differentiated technology which the IBM PC would not offer? Probably not so. It learned from Clayton, or it actually followed Clayton Christensen's product. It created an emotional connect of the technology in a design that a market would value, completely changing the landscape of how the chunky, functional, geeky desktop was replaced by a cool, beautiful, sleek and sexy iMac creating history. And then the Apple suit of products, which created one of the greatest com corporations of today, the most venerated Apple Corporation. Innovation again. Similarly, sensing organizations, this is where, no, no, uh, before, I'm sorry, I missed a point. In the MacBook exercise, we actually help your participants. Your participants actually build an insurance product. They built a product, product messaging, and design. And in the workshop, we got customers. So there were three groups of people the, the class was broken into three or four groups who created a new insurance product and that product they had to message it, create color and an appeal to a completely uninitiated audience which we crowdsourced from the facilities of the hotel in which this program was happening to say why would you buy or not buy a product from a product messaging standpoint. So that was a very interesting and a revealing experience, help the participants learn that it is not a fault technology but the placement of the technology in the context that creates value. And finally, the last section is about sensing opportunities. That in future, if I extrapolate the mega trends, what part of it can I use in my product design now and create an organization responsible and aware and agile to be able to deliver it. So as I end this video, to summarize, therefore this course is not about innovation or managing the process of innovation. This course is figuring out how we use existing projects and programs and to be able to integrate the same under two contexts. Either when I'm an incumbent player and threatened by a new technology or a new market development to create value in the future, or I am fighting against strong incumbents who have asset incumbency and I therefore have to change the narrative by doing different things and doing things differently. That, therefore, 
ultimately boils down to the collective imagination of the leadership and the people in the organization, their culture, their structures and so on and so forth. Hope you had a good time watching this video. Right now I am signing off. See you in the next series of videos. This is Niladri Roy. Thank you very much and thank you for your time and patience.